When it comes to ambient music, if there's one topic that I get asked about the most, it's mixing. of how to mix becomes even more elusive given the complexities and the intricacies of the genre. And when you try to wrap your head around it, there can be all kinds of mental barriers separating you from getting the job done. But what if I told you that mixing for ambient didn't have to be as hard as you thought? When I first started making ambient music, I literally had no idea how to approach mixing it. After all, how hard could it be? Adjust a few faders here and there, make it look cool like you're in some sort of pro audio commercial sitting behind a gigantic mixing board. But when it comes down to it, you're faced with a daunting task of taking all these separate musical parts and making them sound unified through careful level adjustment and frequency. After all, that's all that mixing really is, just level adjustment and frequency. But there's more than that, and that's what I told myself I needed to find out. I spent the next few years researching and gaining knowledge on more broadly focused mixing techniques. Many of the tutorials and much of the information out there addresses mixing music as if you were mixing music for a full band or electronic dance music where there are clear lines between the different instruments that are used, such as bass, drums, guitars, vocals, and synthesizers. But what about ambient, the genre where the lines between anything are completely blurred and you're left with nothing but the vast soundscape to contend with and little to go by as far as the guide goes? The first step when approaching mixing is to identify your goal from mixing before you get started. What kind of track are you making? What are the main elements in the track? How balanced are the actual levels of the audio before you adjust the faders? Or will you make any creative decisions with your mixing that might affect the outcome of your track? While these questions are broad, the answers are important as they'll help you identify what key areas you need to focus your attention on while mixing. Once you've identified and answered those key questions, you can then decide what's the best way to approach it. One way you might start to use is what we call a ghost track method, which involves finding a track of what you want your track to sound like and place the audio file of that track directly in your DAW. You can then use that track as an auditory reference by soloing that track and comparing it to your overall mix. Keep in mind, most tracks from other artists will be mastered, so simply adjust the level of the ghost track to something more sensible, like what mastering would do to a track in terms of loudness. Negative 6 dB is a good place to start, but you can always go higher or lower depending on what your target output level is. Speaking of target levels, it's also important to establish the levels of all your main elements and stick to those levels. Whether you're grouping your tracks into different buses or keeping them separated individually, you want to get a general idea of where those levels should be and write them down. That way, when you approach your next track or mixing project, you'll have a general idea of where the pad should be, the bass, the percussive elements, or any other instrument that usually shows up in your mix. Not every track in your mix is going to need plugins or effects, but you might need a few basic plugins that you can use to help you shape and sculpt your tone further before you reach your final mix. An EQ is always helpful for almost all tone shaping situations for frequency placement or to eliminate some harsh harmonics to make room for other elements to shine through. Modern graphical parametric EQs such as FabFilters Q3 or the EQ8 in Ableton would be my first choices, but you can pretty much use any EQ as long as you feel comfortable using it and it does the job well. Like any other tool in your arsenal, the important thing is not to overuse it and to make careful decisions when it comes to additive or subtractive EQ. Other tools that you might reach for might be a compressor for fattening up your bass line or tightening up a kick drum, a limiter for adding more loudness to any of your elements, or even tools that automatically do the job for you like Isotope's Neutron. Say what you want about tools like this with AI algorithms built in that can actually listen to your track and make adjustments for you, but in my experience, I found Neutron to be a great sounding EQ that's really easy to work with. It's got a listening assistant that will listen to the track that you place it on and attempt to make it sound better by choosing the settings for you, or you can start from scratch and dial in each component one by one. Either way, this product has helped me on more than a few occasions, and I recommend it for anyone who's just starting out or if you need a general idea of where your track sits before you adjust the sound even further. 
One tool you should be cautious of at the beginning of your mixing journey is the exciter. Why might you ask? Well, for one, it's a distortion effect, usually above the 3K range. Yes, it does add some sparkle and shine to anything it touches, but until you've got a handle on mixing with the usual suspects, I suggest you might save the exciter for later on down the line. If you are going to use one, or if you feel comfortable with it, I would also caution using an exciter on a master fader and only use it on individual elements on your mix instead. That way you won't be oversaturating the top end of your mix with an effect that artificially adds more harmonics rather than the actual sounds that your track is composed of. One of the most important things when it comes to mixing is understanding the idea of frequency separation. By definition, this is the process of separating the different elements in your mix so you get a clear and dividing separation between the elements when you're listening to the entire track. One of the fundamental ways that we do this, which is a technique that many of you already do, is by filtering out any low-end information, particularly anything below 80 to 100 hertz on every element that's not your bass track. By doing this, you are literally carving out room for your bass to live while the other tracks can continue to live somewhere else without interfering with the bass. Speaking of bass, it would be a great idea for you to get this into your mind now rather than trying to wait until later, but if you can, it is extremely advantageous to make your bass mono below a certain threshold, say everything below 150 hertz. Yes, I know that sounds like a lot, but if you're like me and you are cautious about your bass phasing out or not sounding solid enough, by making those lower regions mono, you're ensuring that no stereo information is down there at the bottom, giving your track a very dense foundation to live on top of. A few ways you could do this is by using the utility plugin inside of Ableton and hitting the bass mono button or use something similar in your own DAW, or just by making a mono bass from the very start and adding no stereo at all until you reach the effects, if at all, because your bass should be very clear and separated, especially in ambient music. One thing that separates ambient from other genres of music is that because the elements are so blurred, it's more like painting with different colors of sound rather than like using instruments that make up a traditional band. Given that's the case, it's the mixing engineer's job, or your job probably, to let the elements live on their own and have space to breathe. I spoke about the topic sonic depth of field in my ambient for beginners video on this channel, so I won't repeat it here, but depth of field is super important when thinking about how to mix for ambient. Mix for texture and adjust the loudness to taste. Panning is also super important and where you place certain elements in the stereo field can be just as crucial as what the element is. Don't overuse auto panners or anything to that effect, but do be conscious of where your panning is going rather than leaving everything in the center or hard left or hard right. Think of your mix as a wide open canvas and you are the one who's painting on it. If you approach it that way, you'll be able to sculpt the sound more and not be afraid to make some pretty significant changes in the mixing stage. Another technique you might use, which isn't specific to ambient and can be used in any genre, is checking your entire mix in mono, which is a technique that either you've heard of, try for yourself, or use it religiously. As for myself, as soon as I started doing this, I was able to get a far more balanced mix as it's easier to hear the dynamics or loudness of each element without having to wade through the sometimes chaos of the stereo field. Why does this work? Well, for starters, as I just mentioned, stereo information is very distracting to the ear since we have two of them. The constant motion between the left and right stereo fields make for hearing things like level changes harder to pick up on, so when you're hearing them all in mono, all you're listening for is the loudness of the element rather than the effect it has on the overall mix. Most DAWs have a plugin that can do this, so slap it on your master fader and start checking your mixes in mono and then returning to stereo once you're happy with your mix. Now that we've covered some concepts and basic techniques, it's up to you to take it from here. Remember, Mixing is an art form which can take a lifetime to fully master. Each track is gonna be different, but if you spend time gaining a fundamental understanding of what you're doing, those simple mechanics are going to serve you well in the long run. Developing a reliable approach and learning how to use just a few tools can help you get the job done is definitely a step in the right direction. Ambient music is all about subtle changes, so it should come as no surprise that sometimes the less you do, the more you're going to get out of your time spent mixing. 
Subtle changes in texture, loudness, and timbre could be all that you need to take a piece that's relatively flat to something that's deep, spacious, and full of interesting dynamics. The important thing to remember is that mixing, like any other aspect of audio production, takes a ton of time to learn and become good at. Like sound design, mixing is about careful considerations, but also bold and brave artistic ones as well. If you approach mixing for ambient music like you do when you compose a track, you can feel like you're sculpting something out of nothing. Work hard to uncover more details than were previously there and bring out the best of what your track is so your audience has more reasons to come back and listen multiple times. You want your listener to feel like they're uncovering something new each and every time they listen to your track. With time, patience, and the right amount of effort, you'll be able to do this through the process of mixing. So here we are inside of Ableton Live 11. Now, today we're going to mix a track quickly using the pink noise method. What is the pink noise method and why should you use it? I picked this trick up a couple years ago uh, when I was searching for a way to sort of get like a really good baseline template uh, for my mix and then move on from there. The first uh, record that I ever used it on was Celestial from Starterra. And the pick noise method is extremely useful and extremely powerful, and I'll tell you why. Pick noise, uh, unlike its sibling white noise, is a decibel boosted white noise signal. So basically it's just white noise that uh, sort of moves on a slope and it decreases in amplitude uh, by three dB per octave. So the reason why pick noise works as a mixing template is our human ears actually hear that way, where we hear things on a slope rather than a flat uh, plane. So if you use the pink noise as sort of a template for your entire mix, what you're doing is, is you're saying every element is going to push up against that pink noise. And if it does, therefore it follows that perfect slope of which our human ears can hear, all right? So here's how this works. Uh, I have provided you guys with a pink noise sample. You can download it in the link down below in the description box, all right? So I'm gonna put this pink noise sample inside of uh, Ableton, and then I'm gonna put it on a, just like a ghost track, and then I'm going to solo each track, uh, and so you can barely hear each track above the level of the pink noise. Now, I'm not gonna make you guys sit through six minutes of pink noise um, just so I can get this going, but I'm just gonna show you guys how I set this all up, and then you guys can uh, do it on your own, and we'll talk about the final results at the end here. So I'm gonna grab the pink noise here, and again, uh, the link is in the description box down below, uh, and I've provided this pink noise sample for you. Uh, so I'm just gonna grab this pink noise sample and I'm gonna put it into, uh, say, the ghost track on the top of this template, right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate this pink noise uh, all the way across the, the section that I wanna mix. Now this, this track uh, was something that I was working on um, during a video, I created it on a video that I made on my Patreon. So if you wanna hear this track, you can check it out on my Patreon. Let's listen to the track first, and then we're gonna go into mixing it. So here's how the track sets up. So as you can hear, there's like a kick drum in there, there's some hi-hats. Again, I built this track on a recent tutorial video on my Patreon. There's a lot of textures in there. There's some synths and arpeggios. This one comes in near the end. Now this track isn't finished, but at least it gives us some sort of reference to kind of mix against, and it's a it's a track that has a bunch of different elements that have different loudness levels, all right? So um, again, I've duplicated the pink noise all the way across. Now, what I'm gonna do here over on the master fader is I'm going to turn off the limiter of the track, which I've already done, all right? So if you have a limiter on your master fader, turn that off. Now, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to grab um, a spectrum analysis and a utility, all right? Now the utility has one function here, and that is to create 
and just instantly make our whole mix mono. So it has a, conveniently, it has a mono button right here, which means everything that goes through it becomes mono. And if you put that on your master fader, there you go. It's the whole mix turns mono and mixing in mono is a topic for another video entirely. However, I highly recommend, as I said in the beginning part of this video, that you do mix in mono, all right? It's a highly effective way to really hear the amplitude of each individual element um, without being distracted by the stereo signals that have to do with reverb and delays and all kinds of crazy stuff that goes along with ambient. Um, mixing in mono can be a great way to go, all right? So on this spectrum analysis, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the block rate all the way to the top. I'm gonna to take the refresh rate up and the average rate up, all right? Now, what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna solo this pink noise. Um, I'm going to lower the volume here so you guys don't get burned out by this. I've also lowered the noise track uh, by 12 dB. So the noise, you set the noise at negative 12 dB. That allows you some headroom um, when approaching the final mix and then putting it into mastering, all right? So you can use more than that. You can go negative 6 dB, but 12 dB I found is a really great um, starting for your template so you guys can mix off of that. All right, so I'm going to play the pink noise. Now we're gonna just listen to the pink noise only here. And as you can see down here at the bottom, you see that spectrum? That's that perfect pink noise slope. Now that's what we're going to use as our template. So once you can visually see the pink noise, that's what we're gonna use as our template for the rest of our mix. So now that we soloed the pink noise track, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here and we're gonna solo our first, say, audio track. And we're going to mix the level of that audio track so you can barely hear it above the pink noise. Here's how this is gonna go. See how once the drone approaches that noise floor, you can kind of hear it kind of push up right against the noise. That's exactly what you want. You're going to repeat this process for all the tracks. And once you do that, then once you take away the noise, you're gonna have hopefully a uh, well-rounded, a really quick way to get a really well-rounded and uh, deep and dynamic mix, all right? So I'm gonna do this for all the rest of the tracks. Again, I'm probably gonna fast forward this so you don't have to listen to it, but that's the basic process. Again, solo the pink noise, solo each track individually against the pink noise and then adjust the level so it barely reaches over the top of that pink noise. So you should barely hear it right alongside the pink noise track, all right? Here we go. So now that we've mixed each track individually, it's time for the big reveal, all right? So what you're gonna do, now that you've sort of mixed all the levels of each individual track up to that pink noise, is you're going to deactivate the pink noise track. You can either discard it or just leave it there for further reference, all right? So I'm gonna collapse the pink noise track. I'm gonna come over here to the master fader and I'm going to deactivate the mono button on the utility plugin. Now my mix is in stereo. Then I'm also going to turn on my limiter again, all right? So now that everything is all said and done, when we hit play, we should have a much more closer representation of what our final track should sound like, uh, thanks to the pink noise. So here we go. Nice. So as you can hear, things sort of naturally sit where they're supposed to sit without too much fuss. It was all thanks to that pink noise template that we used to mix our track. Now, this is sort of like the middle of the road. Like now you could go 
a number of different ways from here. You can start doing volume automation, you can do send automation, you can, you can go all kinds of crazy with the rest of your mix. But as far as a baseline of where you should start, the pink noise trick is highly effective and I highly recommend it. So if you're looking for a quick way and a quick solution to really kind of zero in on what your track is before you start with any creative decisions, I highly recommend number one, mixing with pink noise and number two, mixing in mono when making volume adjustments before you move into stereo. So that's all there is to it. Whether you're mixing for texture, tonality, or loudness, the techniques that I've discussed on today's video will certainly help you get there. And if you wanna learn more, be sure to check out my Patreon. There, you'll find tons of extra tutorials on this topic. You'll find tons of extra presets for all your favorite synthesizers, the Science Circle, one-on-one -on -one ambient coaching, and so much more. By doing so, not only are you supporting this channel, ensuring that I can keep making tutorials like this, but you're also supporting me as a full-time ambient music and content creator. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.